Hello everyone and welcome back. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, which I moved out of when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS and Sam and I have been married for eight years now. Yes, and we are back at it. We're going to talk a little bit today about a group out of New Zealand, I believe. Yes. And remind us again the name of this group. Gloria Vale. Gloria. Is it Gloria Vale or Glory Vale? Gloria Vale. Gloria Vale. Okay. So very interesting group, which we watched the first episode. It's a three-part series. It's available on... Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. And uh, very interesting. Some, some, a lot of similarities to the FLDS culture, but also some very big differences. And we just wanted to react to some of those differences and similarities and... Uh, Kind of share our thoughts on it. Yeah, we had somebody send this to us. So thank you so much. We love it when people email us or comment and say, hey, react to this because some of these groups, Gloria Vale is a very secluded group. It is so interesting just to see how many similarities it has um, to all sorts of groups, whether it's LDS or FLDS yes. or probably a lot of other um, Christian groups that um, I know we have a ton of people who comment saying, oh, these things are so similar to the FLDS and the church that I grew up in. So these ones are fun. And when we were watching it, yeah, I don't know. I'm excited to do this one. It's a little bit different than what we've done comparing a group that is not polygamous. So that's a huge differentiation right from the beginning. Big differences between the groups, yes. But it's so interesting when you get a group that is secluded and kind of their own in their own little world and doing their own thing how for whatever reason they they become a certain way yeah. Wh whether it's in europe or here in the u.s or new zealand or new zealand wherever it is these groups just tend to fall into this similar category when they are secluded religious groups like that yeah, it's really, really interested so. and really, really interesting. Um, and if you want to hear more about what it was like for Sam to grow up in polygamy, then please like and subscribe. And yeah, and if you want to watch and follow along with us, we're going to do all three. There's three episodes in the series, and um, we don't want to drag it on too long. So we'll do one episode today, and then we'll do two next week to kind of wrap it up. But there was just so much information. At first, we thought, oh, we can go through these three episodes and just do one video. And then after the first episode, we're, I'm like two pages of notes in, and yep. I was like, no, we have to do, we're gonna do a video for every single episode because it's so intriguing. And again, you can watch it on Amazon Prime. It's called uh, Gloria Vale, A World Apart, yes. for anyone who wants to watch. And it sounds like they're going to be, or they maybe just came out with a movie or a documentary. A documentary. Not, a, to, for what we could find anyway, it was not available here in the US yet. So yeah. we'll do a reaction to that later on in case you come across that uh, documentary as well. Yeah, it sounded like it's in some film festivals right now and definitely winning awards. Um, this one was done in 2014, but the one that's right now on the circuit of um, doing the festivals was just barely in 2022. And so I think it's also going to be fun to kind of compare as that comes out to see um, kind of what their take is on their documentary and if there's a different spin on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's going to be fun. Because these groups, well, we'll see if Glory Veil changes over time, but a lot of religious groups tend to change over the years. So we'll see. It'll be interesting to see if it's different now today than it was in 2014. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing that, like Sam kind of already mentioned, um, they are in New Zealand. And it's a group of about 500 people. So it's a really, really small group. Um, at the largest point, what was the FLDS at? Around 10,000. So Around 10, very big difference in numbers, but they're very similar in the fact that they don't use contraception. And it is like they said they have one of the highest birth rates in the world. So no contraception. They have like 30 to 40 babies a year. And obviously that's going to like continue to exponentially grow. Yes. So lots and lots of babies, lots and lots of children. It sounded like everybody had like what, 11, 12 kids. Um, yeah, there were something I didn't catch. Maybe you did, Melissa. Uh, there were a lot of adults that were talking about how they were born and raised in this community. Yeah. Did they mention when they started? Oh, you know what? I don't think they mentioned... Or when it was founded. I don't think they mentioned how, like, exactly how it was founded. Um, no. Most maybe in the next episode. Yeah. M maybe that's coming. Yeah, maybe we'll hear more of the history in future episodes. But 
right now they're kind of focusing on one family in particular and how one young man is like coming of age and is getting ready to be married. Um, a couple of things just about the group in general, as it was going through and talking about, they live the, we call it consecration, right? In the LDS church and the FLDS. So the LDS church tried to live the law of consecration um, in Joseph Smith's time, which is where everybody as a community combines all of their, their work, like, mm. and all of their money and all of everything they do is just for the greater good of the community. Um, it didn't work in Joseph Smith's time because obviously when people are not able to make money for themselves and everything goes into a group, you're going to have um, discrepancies in work and stuff seems to be what happened then and what would happen now for most part. But the FLDS also did try that and they, they did it for a while. Well, they were doing it in Texas when they had that compound in Texas there for a while and uh, in El Dorado, as they call it. And it seemed to be working out for them. Well, I don't know that the members really had a choice, but exactly. it, it, it was working out for them, I guess you could say, until the the authorities came and took everything away, or shut the place down, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it, it seemed to be working, but in the actual community of Short Creek, the FLDS, uh, to my knowledge, have not been successful in, in this uh, law of consecration. And they did it in later times. When we had Manti on, he was talking about the fact that they did change it to that way, meaning that like everybody gave everything they had to the church and then like they would have to go and ask for soap and shampoo and like every single little thing because nobody made money for themselves. So the church tried to do it later on after that's, Sam left, but they didn't do it when you were there. Yeah, okay. in Short Creek. That's, that's true. Okay. Um, I think it was the same time that they were going to Texas and stuff though, because Manti said that, but I know that was like long after you had left. Right. And I don't believe that type of thing is happening now just because the community is so dispersed and spread out at this point that it would be difficult to do that it's kind of everyone for themselves at this point yeah so uh, we anyway in the lds church and the flds they called that the law of consecration um they called it in gloria vale they called it um submitted to the church all the people are submitted to the church um which i just thought some of the wording was like really interesting yeah. and kind of differentiated um, things between the LDS, FLDS, and the way they worded. So submitted to the church is yeah. basically consecration. And this is a very extreme, they, they, li they live this to the extreme. Uh, nobody, nobody, any money nobody themselves. takes a paycheck home. Nothing. Yeah. It's all, they just do the work around the community. To my knowledge, everyone works within the community. It's not mm -hmm. like they are working outside going uh, with any, for, of any type of job. In the FLDS, we would go out and do construction work in uh, well all over uh, different states uh, throughout the country and it's, but here in Gloriaville it seems that it's all working within the community self-sufficient and nobody depends on a job it's, well they have assignments and duties within the community but no one has what you would call a, an actual paying job regular job outside the community but uh -huh. yeah they're very self-sufficient and they said that all of their money just goes into a trust and then the leaders are called shepherds, which obviously um, a Christian type naming there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the shepherds decide this group of um, elder men go in and decide how the money is going to be used for everyone. So right. they even showed, you know, they were deliberating about um, drilling for oil on their land. So something like that was going to cost them a million dollars. They sit down. And um, even in the meeting, very, very clear that they truly believe they're just doing like the Lord's will. So every single thing that they said in the meeting was like, I feel impressed that this is what God wants. And the next person would be like, I feel impressed this is what God wants. And right. so they, in their mind, definitely are just trying to do what they believe is the will of God. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's even something they say. One, one of the young girls, when she was baptized, it showed a quick clip of that. And she basically said that, she said, I'm giving up my will and I am. Oh, I think I wrote it down. Did you? Okay, good. Yeah. Because I know I'm not saying it correctly. Yeah. So she, when she was baptized, she said, um, I've surrendered my will. Surrendered. And give my life to God. Yeah. So surrendering her will. So it's all about for every, and it seems like even small decisions, especially the big decisions, but even some of the small decisions 
was were, were brought before the elders or brought before the uh, the shepherds, and they would help people decide if, if it was okay. Uh, I mean, there's we're going to get into a lot more, but all I mean, even the types of books that you would read, yes, uh, yeah, was were approved by these uh, leaders of the church. Yeah, um, lots of working from a young age was another thing mm -hmm. because everybody in the community had to work together, and they talked about the fact that like the women were had so many children that the best way for the moms to be able to be there for their young children was to basically have the children who were in that middle age range before becoming adults they all worked so like the women in the kitchen were mostly like the teenage girls and the younger girls and everybody was helping um and in the sewing rooms you know they make all their own clothes but from a very young age and they said you know the teenagers um, wouldn't even complain. They are not like typical teenagers. They just worked hard and that reminded me a ton of the FLES. Right, definitely. And I mean, that was something that, I mean, it was a little different. Uh, there, At a younger age, there was a lot to do around the community. We did do a lot of growing our own crops and uh, had our own dairy farm and that type of thing. When I was younger living in the community, I would oftentimes uh, just help out for free, just you know, just because that's what we did. And that's, it was something that I, I speaking for myself here, I uh, really enjoyed. I didn't ever feel that I was being forced to do it. I mean, there were some chores and types of things that I enjoyed doing more than others, but like working at the dairy farm, I really enjoyed that. And I would prefer to do that over going out and working. And even though I could go out and work and uh, outside of the community and make money, Sometimes I prefer just stay in the community and don't and not make any work because I enjoy that type of thing. It's just the the feeling of, of being a part of the community and helping out the community uh, as as you know as we needed it. So it's it's interesting how sometimes that felt more fulfilling than going out and making money. Absolutely. And one girl says at one point that like serving and feeling like you're serving the community or serving God. Um, is very fulfilling and how she was grateful to be able to do that and not have to deal with like the um, awful things of the world and be able to just serve. And I feel the same way, like there was lots of youth projects in the LDS church. Um, I remember going and working at the cannery mm -hmm. like from a young yeah. age because you can start doing that, I want to say when you're 14, maybe it was 12, but um, I want to say, say it was 14 because I remember at 16 being able to drive myself and I would go like on days I had school off, I would go to the cannery and work. And yeah, there's something fulfilling about feeling like you are serving others mm -hmm. and also like helping out your church organization as well. So I feel like having that sense of purpose in your youth is not necessarily a bad thing. Like it can yeah. be really good and it can be fulfilling. Well, well, yeah, giving up some of your time just to help others and serve others is uh, generally in um, based on my experience, a very fulfilling, great feeling that you get by doing that. So uh, I can see the, the appeal of just being, not having to worry about uh, a nine to five, you know, just waking up and doing what needs to be done to, to provide for this big family slash community that you live with. Yeah. And they would teach the kids like trades too. So yeah. one of the pilots, like he would taking some boys and every day he'd be teaching them different skills um, about maintenance on the plane and mechanics. And so they really tried to, um, it seemed like they were going to, they got to pick the shepherds and the elders got to pick what jobs people were going to do. So the main boy that they were following around in this documentary, you know, he said he had done this and then he got assigned to um, do something else later. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so th definitely everything was assigned, you know, it's very interesting, even more so than the FLDS in my, in my experience. Everything was, this is exactly what you're going to do, uh, almost like it was a, a calling from God that this is how your life should be set out exactly. And that's what they would say. They would say this is, we feel this is what God wants for you. That's the type of wordage they would use. Yeah, and in the FLDS it seemed like, like you could kind of do whatever you were going to do as long as it was making money that they could eventually have. <laughs> but here where everything was consecrated, it, you'd almost have to have, you'd have to have enough of everything you needed, right? So it almost makes sense that in such a small group, somebody would have to be like, okay, we need someone here. We need someone there. We need someone there. They seem to be really efficient. Like you'd see them with um, like spreadsheets and charts and 
in order to make a community like that run, I'd say you'd have to be that organized. So it seemed like a very organized group that definitely knew like what they needed done and when and how and and they made sure that it happened. Yeah. Um they had very similar like family structures in the fact that like the um man was the head of the household, that a wife was to submit to her husband. Um lots of talking about submitting to the church, submitting to your husband and talking about sons like oh i could never have asked for a better son because he respected he's always respected me so that, yes i found that very interesting i know that that would be something that would be heard in the flds community as well some similarities here uh, is a father would be very proud or happy for his son if he felt that he was being respected by that son so that's a very common thing i feel like uh and also, I don't know if we've pointed this out yet, but the way they dressed was very unique. So yes. that's also similar to the FLDS. They're they're all, off in their own little community, and they have created their way of dressing. All of the women are always wearing a white bonnet, I guess you could yeah. call, no, covering their hair. Uh, they said that that was a sign of submission to their husband. Is that correct? Yeah, which I thought was interesting because I... In my mind, when we first saw it, because it was a little ways into the episode when they talked about um, the hair and it being covered, because a lot of different religions cover their hair for lots of different reasons. Um, I know I wrote it down somewhere, but I'm pretty sure, yep, head covering shows submission to their submission. to the man, yeah. um, which a lot of times I feel like it's like showing respect to God. But, so when they said it's showing submission to the man, I thought that was really interesting. And then they wear dresses. And... They all wear the same color dress, and they were talking about how it's an efficiency thing. So they would create all the dresses in like these, um, what's the right word? I think they called it a lineup or a line. Yeah, so basically they would go through and they're like making, how many of the dresses do we need in this size? Boom, all in one like shot. Thousands. I mean, yeah, uh, hundreds. At least hundreds, but probably up to the thousands. <laughs> yeah, so they're creating these dresses in big um, drives, like one at a time. And it was very interesting. And they're all the same color except for the wedding dresses. So it's like a dark blue for their regular dresses. And then their wedding dresses were either a light pink or a light baby blue. But who got to pick the color of the wedding dress? I bet you could not guess who got to choose the color of the wedding dress. Dun, dun, dun. Drum roll, please. The (laughs) husband-to-be. The husband-to-be, of course. So it's very, yes, it, it it's it's so i mean and when listening to these men they they talked about well uh yes we're in charge because we know that's what god wants and then you listen to the women and they are very happy really uh all the women look for is a man that is going to be obedient to the church follow god be obedient to god follow the rules that's that's all they really care about it, it seems they're not about who has the nicest car or who has the most money or who looks the nicest or any of those types of things it's all about who's going to be the most faithful faithful to the church and to god they yeah. didn't they didn't even mention who's going to be the most faithful to me they said to to the church and to god because they feel that the man is in charge what's important is that that woman is faithful to him that's kind of the vibe they give definitely but so. i thought that was interesting because in every other culture like even in the FLDS, like the women make their wedding dresses, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's a pretty traditional thing that the woman gets to pick out. And in normal society, I would say it's very, very common that the groom's not supposed to see you in your wedding dress until your wedding day. So to have like the groom get to pick the color of the dress and like be in charge of the dress picking um, kind of made me giggle a little bit. I was like, really? Do they need one more thing to be in charge of? <laughs> like, I don't know. So this is a question. <laughs> like, let for... the girl have this one thing. Let her pick her wedding dress. <laughs> Goodness. Uh, this is a question for everyone watching and for you as well. Okay. In, in, in your experience and in everyone else's experience, is it common for the husband to be, to be involved in color choices for the wedding? Okay. Oh, well, I, yeah, I can't wait to find the comments on this. Be, be, oh, sorry, because uh, we, we find it so crazy that he got to choose the color of the dress. Well, and a lot of times the wedding dresses are white, so that's not a, I don't know. I feel like choosing a color of a dress isn't the, something that everyone has to do to begin with. Yeah. Uh, but there are, the, for the, for the um, 
receptions and things. There's the color choices and all of that that go along with it. So the question is, is it common for the husband to be to help choose those colors? Well, I feel like you and I made that choice together, but let's be real about it. If I had had a color that was like I was determined on, um, you would have let me. You would have let me pick whatever oh, I wanted. 100%, 100%, yes. We did decide together because we like to make decisions together, but you're right. Uh, some of those decisions, anybody who's out there and is married knows that there are some decisions that you make together, but one of the people feel really strongly about it, and as a good spouse, you're like, okay, let's go with that, right? So if someone feels strongly and the other person doesn't, then it makes sense to go along with it. Yeah. But I am curious to see in the comments. Um, and they, when they were getting ready for this wedding, just coming back to Gloria Vale, um, like the whole community gets together and gets ready. Um, and I mean, even preparing a meal, they said it was going to be attended by like 480 Almost, almost, the, that, entire almost community, the entire community. Almost the entire community. there's 500 in the community. Uh -huh. We're going to be at the wedding. Um, yeah, so it was there was a lot. But before we get into what the wedding was actually like, we have to talk about how they chose who they were going to marry. Because this is one, as I was like watching, I was like on the edge of my seat. Because we knew they don't practice polygamy. So that's one thing that they have going for them. Um, but the choosing of like their courtship and like choosing their marriages were still very unique and still had some similarities to the FLDS. So we, we may even want to step back a little bit and talk about how the relationship between men and women outside of the family. Go for it. Before even getting to the point of marriage. Just like the FLDS. Similar to the FLDS. No yeah. looky, no touchy. <laughs> no, no allowed, nothing. No touchy. No, ser seriously, and it seemed to be just as strict as the FLDS. No, nobody went on any dates. Uh, nobody was allowed to even consider who they were going to marry in the FLDS church. Here, it's a little bit different. Yeah, but because they're so separated, he even said, like, this, this young man that they're following, he's like, you know... I've been living in the same community as my wife this whole time, but he had never even talked to her. So because they are so separated for all of their chores and for most of their learning and all these things, um, they might know who, they, I guess they could have an eye out for somebody, but that definitely was not their priority at all, it sounds like. Like he was not prioritizing that until he felt ready to get married. He'd go to his father, say, do you think I'm ready to get married? And then most importantly, when he felt like it was time to get married, he went to the shepherds, sat down, said, I feel like I'm ready. I feel like God, well, I should clarify. I feel like God thinks that I'm ready. And the shepherds would agree, yes, we think God thinks you're ready. Um, so even though he has to go to the shepherds, a couple of things that differentiated a lot, which I thought were good, I guess I'll go through. It's similar to the fact that you have to go to the leaders, right? Like you still have to get permission. You're not just going to go and date somebody. But they had two things going for them. They're so much better. I mean, other than not being in polygamy. Um, but they would pick out um, girls within the same age range. So there was no like older men marrying Younger. young women or, or even underage women. or underage mm -hmm. girls. Um, so that was a good thing. And then they also, they gave the, the boy a list and they said they actually made sure that they weren't marrying any first cousins or second cousins. So they had like a lineage of all the people and they basically said, here are the girls that are within your age range that are not a first or second cousin. Here's a list. Go and pray about it. Yeah. Which is interesting, right? That uh, at least they got to choose to some extent. I don't know. I... I, uh, I mean, this, this young man that they're following around, he such a good boy, rule follower, mm -hmm. right? Like he was uh, doing everything and, and everything that he did, he wanted to make sure that's what God wanted, not just what he wanted. He didn't yeah. want to really choose for himself because he wanted to bring it before the leaders and uh, help, have them help him so that he did what God wanted, not what he wanted. Yeah. Right? He's oh very, man, very I, I don't think I would have made it in that community. It's funny, <laughs> funny coming from me, right? Because I grew up in the FLDS where there were a lot of rules, but uh, I also didn't follow the, all those rules all the time, right? So it's interesting to hear uh, that he was just such a straight arrow, it seemed. Followed all the rules. Yeah, and he said, you know, that he prayed about it and he felt like God impressed a certain name on his mind. 
And it was a testimony builder for him because he said a certain name from the list popped in his mind. He felt like that was um, a sign from God. And when he went to the shepherds and said, this is the name of the girl that I think I'm supposed to marry, um, they said God had also impressed them that as well. And he's like, and that just proves that, you know, it was God's decision and not anybody else's because we were all on the same page. So um, another cool thing is, and again, I know this is, you have to take this with a grain of salt, but um, it was funny. So he goes and he he calls her father, her parents, and says, you know, I feel impressed I'm supposed to marry your daughter. They have set up a meeting and they propose before they start dating, which is kind of like hilarious. But she did get to go and pray about it and um, ponder for herself and pray and decide if she wanted to marry him. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know what would happen if she had come back and said, no, I don't think so. Like if that would have been honored or not, um, which is where I get into whether or not it was really consent or if it was, you know what I mean? That's right. a little bit, or a lot of social pressure. Right. But the Good. fact that they even allowed it, like in the FLDS, the girls aren't told, oh, go pray about it. Mm -hmm. No, this is what God wants for you. And this is what you are going to do in the FLDS. So at least... They made it feel like she was getting a choice at least. <laughs> yeah, and she was 21. <laughs> and she was, yes, exactly. She was uh, 21, so she was an adult. And there were definitely a lot of good things, uh, I guess better things compared to the FLDS in some ways. But I mean, six. he had six girls on the short list, so it's not like there's a lot of people to pick from. Um, but in that scenario, at least there, it seemed like they... We're trying to give him as many viable options as possible in a super small community. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting after he proposed to her and she said yes, and then uh, the parents were in agreement and everything was lovely. They went, or he announced it before the entire community of 500 people. They were all sitting for dinner, and it seems like they do do this frequently where they all eat. Announcement. They all eat together. Like every meal. Every meal, the entire community. That's a lot of people. A few more than we have at our dinner table. <laughs> Just a few. And so he announces it, but so he stands up and he announces it, right? But what I found interesting is even in the announcement of their <laughs> engagement slash wedding to be very soon, because the wedding came in five weeks. five weeks later, they were on the opposite sides of this room. Like, and this room was big, 500 people, remember? <laughs> opposite sides. He stands up, announces it. She stands up and kind of, and everyone you cheers. know, and everyone cheers. And she's shy, so she didn't really seem that excited. And then she sits back down, and that was that. It's, there wasn't any walk together and sh at least shake hands or, or meet eye contact or something. No, well, it remember, was interesting. They weren't allowed to, they still were not allowed to touch, mm -hmm. even hold hands until their wedding day. So for the next five weeks after they agree to being married, then they have five weeks to prepare into court. Um, before they get married. They said mostly it's the time to get to know each other's families, to get to know each other. Um, they could never be left alone um, or without a chaperone or anything like that, but just an opportunity to even get to know. Um, obviously, those five weeks are a lot more than how long did the FLDS get? Uh, generally, a couple of few days, maybe. A few days, maybe. Uh -huh. And again, it wasn't an option, and it wasn't something that either one of them could go and pray about and say no to. I mean, there were, during those few days, they were encouraged to pray about it and help and, and ask God to help them feel connected and, and understand the, the why it was that they were meant to be together and those types of things. But it wasn't go pray and see if it's what God wants. No, it was in the FLDS I'm talking about. It was, hey, this is what God wants. You two need to figure this out, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, that's more of the vibe. But, but here, yeah, it seemed like it was more you can make the decision on your own. Yeah, I think the story of Elizabeth that we covered last week was the first woman that I've ever heard of that had asked like the prophet, like, can I go pray about this? And uh, apparently he wasn't very happy about that. That's the first time I'd ever heard about that in the FLDS. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, they have five weeks to prepare for their wedding. Um, and it's very, yeah, it's just super, they said the divorce rate is zero, um, which isn't surprising in such a small group. And everybody is so tight knit that I don't know. I can just see that. Well, they even said that the divorce wasn't an option. Uh, period. Uh, they, they it was even said on this short documentary that if 
someone disagreed or there was a problem in a marriage, they had to just figure it out. That was that was their option. Figure it out. Figure it out. Exactly. So um, they never spoken before their proposal. They were not allowed to hold hands or kiss. Um, I did think that it was cute that the youth, they had like a special, it would be like a bachelor and bachelorette party type thing um, or bachelor party, but it was this big day the day before their wedding where the youth would all plan something fun for the couple for the day before, which I thought was super cute actually. Right, yeah. And they said it was like, you know, all the parents would kind of look on, like the kids weren't working, right? They did fun things and made all these fun activities. And um, they said it was a chance for them to like have their last day of being a youth and being a kid before getting married and starting their families. So I thought that was kind of adorable. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was just that all these kids were like coming up with of, something special. Exactly. A symbol of, okay, I am done with my single life and now I'm on to the, the boring adult married life. No, I'm just <laughs> joking. But, but yeah, that's kind of the, it seemed just to be that, uh, like, what's the word? Transfer or. Yeah. Like a nice little uh, for, farewell. For one life to another. So, but yeah, very interesting. And then the day of the wedding uh, was a very interesting experience to watch. Yeah, it was. So, I mean, the one thing about having such a tight knit community, and Sam and I were talking about the fact that every religious community, and the smaller it is, the I think the more powerful it is in the sense that everything that happened was supported by 500 people. Everybody you know, they knew and cared about in yeah. this world. All were together supporting them and everything through the announcement and then at the actual wedding, everybody was there encouraging them and um, I don't know, even in their baptisms, you know, they talk about one of the girls being baptized and for that, I mean, you have like 500 people looking on, supporting you, loving you, caring about you. Yeah, There's power to that. Exactly. I mean, the hillside next to this water where they were being baptized was just covered in people. <laughs> And it, it immediately made me or brought back memories of my experience in both the FLDS and then later in the LDS church of the power of community and the power of this uh, support with so many people uh, that, that are so proud of you for what you're doing and so happy for you. Like it, it makes you feel so good about your choices and makes you, it gives you this, uh, I guess, feeling of, of security that this is for sure what I'm supposed to be doing because you feel so good about it, right? Yeah. The, the power of community and support from so many loved ones is, is very, it's a big thing. It's a very powerful thing. Yeah. Their wedding ceremony, I mean, obviously was performed by shepherds. They did get a legal marriage license. Yeah. Um, so they did go into the nearby town, get um, all the legal paperwork done. And then the shepherds like talks during... <laughs> during very the wedding ceremony. interesting and very direct. Go, right. wa go watch it because I can't even do it justice to like the awkwardness. Um, they talk a lot about becoming one flesh, if you know what I mean. And um, it was just super funny that, I don't know, it was just kind of uncomfortable because you're like, okay, these kids have not been able to hold hands. Oh, like at the end of the ceremony, instead of like kissing the bride, they gave each other this big old hug, and it was the first time they got into touch. First time ever to touch. Ever and to touch. A, it was a hug. It was a big hug, and the the little, I should have called him a little boy because he was a man, but he just seemed so young still. I think he was 20, or was he 21 yeah, as well? I believe it, early 20s. Anyway, so he gives her this big hug, and it was just so, like, cute and innocent. And then they're and told, long, very long, very hug. long. You can tell how excited they were to, to finally just, be able to touch. <laughs> yeah, how could they not be right? But then the expectation is that then, so they they leave in a carriage after the wedding ceremony, and they said it so matter of factly. But the one woman said she's like, then they go and they consummate their marriage, and then they come back for a meal. So they they are. <laughs> Before the wedding, they this this honeymoon suite, I guess you could call it, was created, made up for them. By both of their parents. So I want all of you to think now for a second that your honeymoon night, your like very first night together, and it's the parents of the bride and the parents of the groom put together the honeymoon suite. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're expecting you to go use that room before you come back for the meal. I mean, everybody, I feel like, in the outside world, 
always jokes about if you go and try to do anything in between the ceremony and the reception, right? Like, oh, someone will, someone don't will do notice that. your hair is messed up or something. Yeah, like, you know, or, oh, you don't have to do the walk of shame, so you better not go do that. Like, yeah. I feel like it's something that people feel really embarrassed or they make sure they don't do that so that they're not embarrassed coming into the reception, right? And this is coming, you're, you're, you're speaking experience from the LDS church oh, experience. Yes. A lot of people here are going to say, wait, what are you talking about? Okay. So clarify that. Oh, okay, yeah. I guess that's true because if you so in the LDS church if you're saving yourself for marriage it was always a joke of whether or not after you're sealed are you going to go and try to sneak off to a hotel room before going to your reception and that being, night being sealed slash the ceiling the was, ceiling is the marriage that's what was held in the temple the LDS temple yes and so um, because there is no sex outside of marriage or before marriage um, that was like kind of an ongoing joke that don't do that because then people are going to ask at your reception or like, or yeah, or hint at and be like, oh, did you, did you have it? Did you do anything in between the, the, uh, the ceiling and the reception? Right. Like people give you a hard time. So, um, people would either like make sure that the reception was right after so that nobody could make you feel awkward or uncomfortable or I don't know. It's just a whole like funny social thing when, when you're saving yourself for marriage then there's this expectation that like you're losing your virginity on your wedding night right and then it feels like everybody knows what's going to happen anyway so that's kind of like the lds perspective and feeling for i feel like a lot of lds couples right that are waiting for marriage so in this case though i'm like can you imagine if they're like okay you have to go do that and then you come back it was it was expected it was required <laughs> that they did this it wasn't an option i mean they both yeah. knew that they were getting married. They were going to have a long hug. And then they were going to be placed in a beautiful little carriage. Very, very, very small vehicle. It was so, so cute. cute. You have to see it. I, I, I just Maybe imagine, I'll put a picture of my kids. I just imagine myself sitting in that, how small <laughs> that would look. It would look like a toy car. Anyway, so there, someone drives them. They're in the back seat. Drives them over to the this hun, room. this room that was made up for them and drops them off and says, All right, we'll see you for dinner. Go go do the thing, and and then just, they did. They, we were we couldn't help but chuckle. It was just like it was whoa. It was this so is awkward, so interesting. Yeah, and then I mean, obviously they figured it out because four months later she was. They, they're like four months later, and you they're like to, she's eighteen weeks pregnant. You have to wonder if someone gave them the talk. Someone would have to. Right? Can you go from not touching at all, like never touching the opposite sex at all your entire life, and then just be able to go consummate a marriage you have, you have to without some if, kind of education? They do have a home, uh, like a school system there. Yeah, I wonder if, if sex ed was one of the topics. I don't know. But there had to have been there, something. There must have been something. Because they figured it out, and she was pregnant a couple months later with obviously a honeymoon baby. So it was... Very, very awkward and cute to watch. So, um, yeah, if anyone feels like feeling uncomfortable, watch that part. Along with the what you were saying before, one interesting thing, too, is when they get married. So this whole community, nobody gets their own houses. Oh, yes. So after you get married, you get a room. So there's, for 500 people, there's four, four hostels. Four. Okay, so there's hostels, four. Four houses. Four houses. They call them hostels. hostels. Do they call them hostels? Hostels is when like you have like your own room. I think. I'm, I'm I learning. I'm hostels. learning new things here right now. So Maybe sorry else. about that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, there's, four of these. <laughs> there's four houses. We can call house. Four houses, and everybody, every family just had rooms assigned. And if they needed more than one room, then they would have two rooms. And they said when a couple got married, then they would get their own room for their new little family, and it would typically be placed near the wife's parents and so i mean can you imagine talk about uh if anyone does not get along with the in-laws <laughs> <laughs> you know i, I mean, don't think they had a choice sheesh yeah. that is interesting I mean, we're, we're, we're talking you know knock on the wall <laughs> hey in-laws you know like so interesting that <sighs> it's just one big house i mean where i grew up there was a lot of us kids in the house so it was almost impossible to have any kind of privacy but you know we were all just young kids you know it wasn't yeah. it was I, I couldn't imagine getting married and then staying in that same house that just yeah it's wow well every single meal like we said was all together um and in huge huge commercial kitchens to be able to create every single meal together um but yeah so 
that was kind of their living situation. Like Sam said, they completely independent. Um, even their schooling was mm -hmm. all done there. Um, I did admire that they sounded like they did all the way through high school. Um, they had a lot of schooling. They said it was very similar, and they they met most of the New Zealand requirements in like math and reading. The only thing that was super different is they said their science. They taught creationalism rather than evolution, and um, so their history and history and, and science, science were, were slightly different. But their like um, their reading and um, let's just say the math were the uh, how do they word it the. Dinosaurs survived because the baby ones were the ones put on the ark. I think is how they worded it. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it's, so interesting. And so they even, yeah, they talked about the fact that the dinosaurs, like, when would the dinosaurs have been created? Uh, you know, ten thousand years ago when the Earth was created, and showing that timeline, like, in the schoolroom. But I know that sounds crazy, but I had also heard that growing up LDS mm. that the dinosaurs couldn't fit on the ark. I had heard that. So, and I'm not saying that's doctrine by the LDS Church. Please don't. That's not what I'm saying. Right, I don't. Okay. The LDS Church didn't teach People that, but that grow, was theories right. that I had heard growing up. And when you're a kid and you don't understand how old the dinosaurs really are, or how they figured that out, because I was also taught to like that science. They didn't know the, what they. Oh, okay. Well, how would they really know that? How could they even really know that it's you know hundreds of hundreds of thousands of years old there's no way for them to really know that so science could always catch up with what the what the uh, timeline of the bible was that's and kind of what when you are following a very strict religious timeline you know a lot of people just are under the impression that eventually the scientists will catch up to god and realize that this timeline here that's laid out before me in the scriptures is factual and what the scientists are finding today is just, uh, you know, eventually they'll get there. Yeah. Isn't that, so it's just an interesting way to look at things, I guess. Yeah, and it's just one of those things that while them saying that sounds so crazy to me now, um, I was like, it's just one more thing that it sounds crazy, but I was also taught that as well. I mean, a very long time ago, and I know better now, but... And especially in a small community where you're, everything that you read is censored and everything you watch is censored and all those, and listen to, and the music and all of that. I mean, can you blame anyone for believing what they're taught? No. How would they, how would they know any different, right? Exactly. Um, rather than the mothers, like, you know, um, LDS... It was emphasized when I was growing up to be stay-at-home mothers and in the FLDS, the same thing. They talked about the fact that because all, they needed all the people to do the different jobs in the community, the women would stay with their babies um, in their rooms for, you know, like I think she said three to four weeks. And then they would, if they had certain jobs within the community, they would go back to that. And they had childcare where certain people would take care of all of the small children. So they had nursery, and then they had um, preschool, and then they would go into school. So the kids were taken care of um, by select women um, as a group, basically, so that the other women could continue to work and contribute. So it wasn't very long that they had before they went back yeah. to their jobs. Just a few weeks, and then they were expected to be back back at it uh, the, in the in the. The, the lady that had a baby in the show that we just, or the episode that we just watched, uh, her, her job was making dresses. Yep. And so, She's the seamstress. So she was expected to get right back at it and start making those dresses. So. And I think that was the boy who got married. It was his mother, wasn't it? Yeah. Because he was one of ten and they said that the 11th was mm -hmm. coming soon. So to have a baby right after your son is getting married. Um, yeah, I didn't remember who the who the girl was or the lady was, but it could have been. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure it was. So I mean, definitely, um, yeah. yeah, just as many children as possible. No contraception. The little newlywed couple, um, you know, obviously pregnant right away, and you know they said, "Where would you like to be in a year?" Oh, yeah. I guess we'll kind of. I think we can end on this because that's about where it ended. The, yeah, the, the episode. And so this is the first one. There's two more to come. Oh, there's oh. only one other thing that we should probably touch on, actually. Okay. Was that they had a concert season. Oh, yes. Where they would invite people from outside the community, and they would come and they would do, like, musicals, and they would do performances and orchestras and all these different performances where people could come from the outside community 
and come and watch and get a meal. And I, at first, my mentality was they probably do this for money, right? But they said it was for free. It was just an opportunity All for them to be able. Was yeah. Free, huh? They said that it ended up being for 5,000 guests during this concert season. And it was an opportunity, they said, for their youth to get to see people from the outside world and um, for them to also talk to people. And I, I don't want to say they proselyted it, but they did mention that like they could answer questions for people. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like it was very similar to the way that growing up LDS, where um, it was an opportunity to like share how happy you were in your religion. And like one of the young girls was like, yeah, I talked to this, this other young girl and she was talking about this struggle and that struggle. And I'm so grateful that I don't have to deal with those things of the world. Mm -hmm. And I feel like <clears throat> that happened a lot in the LDS where we would see certain things or certain uh, family situations or certain people struggling with different things and be like, oh, I'm so grateful for the church so that I don't have to have those struggles, right? It was always easy to look to the outside world and say, that's because they don't have the church, but mm -hmm. I do, so I don't have those those same struggles. Right, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a mindset, right? Uh, for those that are, and this is something that he brings up in the end, which we'll touch on, but for those that are just surviving this life, I guess, in hopes for what's to come in the next life, right? They're, they have their eyes, the sights set on what's to come, not necessarily what's going on here. Here they're just being obedient and following rules. It's all about what's coming in the next life. It's easy to look at life's struggles here and just say, oh, it's no big deal because all that really matters is the life after this. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of religious people that, that, that feel that way. And, uh, and, you know, so it's, that's one, I would say, one very easy way to avoid life struggles and look past them when you have that mindset. Yeah. At the very end, the couple, <clears throat> they were super cute. The girl was so shy, like, throughout the whole thing um, when they were recording and stuff. And I was like, she's, I hope she's happy about this because she just seems so shy. And they actually did seem, like, super happy yeah. and cute um, four months later. And um, they said, so the interviewer asked, like, where will you be in one year? And I wasn't expecting this. Like, obviously, they're going to have a new baby, right? And he's like, you know, I have a baby, but hopefully we will be in heaven and the Lord will have returned. And I was like, oh my goodness, like how many people would say like, where do you hope to be in a year? And someone would say heaven. And when he said it, I was like, what? And then I realized it's because of the second coming. And this group believes that it's happening soon because the next question was, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And he said, well, the second coming is definitely gonna be happening before then. So I'll definitely be in heaven and until then, We'll just want to have as many children as possible and yeah. love and be happy with my wife. And I was like, the the amount of certainty, obviously he was wrong about the first year because this was in 2014. So he's uh, wrong on one account. We'll find out by next year if he's right on the second he one. He was just hopeful for the first year, but he's mm -hmm. convinced that before the 10 years is up that uh, Christ will have returned and, and he will be in heaven at that point. Yeah, I'm very curious if the next episodes, they kind of dive a little bit deeper into that because one of the other um, shepherds had mentioned that, you know, we don't know when the Lord's going to come for the second time, but I'm pretty sure it's going to happen in my lifetime. And so I'm very curious to find out a little bit more about their beliefs about the second coming and the timeline of when that will happen. If maybe that's what is guiding all of this. Yeah, and another similarity to the FLDS Church is the prophesying of the end of days and the, the second coming and and everyone being either the, the wicked being destroyed and the, the righteous being lifted up and, and that type of talk seems to be very common among these uh, small, smaller groups, smaller groups, you know, and I mean, it's it's a it's a harsh word, but, you know, fear sells. And uh, it's, it's, it's easy to convince people of something if they're afraid of the alternative. So. Yeah, no, it's true. And I think the, oh, when some groups, I think the most successful, small, extreme religious groups tend to be when they self-fear 
but make it look like happiness. Mm -hmm. And that was like the sense the entire time is all of these people sincerely seem so happy. Yeah. And I think they are. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of the times, the a lot of people in the FLDS, it was the same type of thing. Like, the people who are out there, I mean, depending, because there were definitely big differences, but to them, and especially, like, within your family, like, your mother would be like, she's just truly happy. Oh, yeah, definitely, 100%. Uh, she's convinced that... Uh... There is nothing in this entire world that would be better for her than what she is currently, uh, what she currently has and the situation that she is currently in. And she, she believes that full heartedly, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say that when, you, when people don't realize that it's actually fear that's driving them and when they can be convinced that they are truly happy in their fear, that is the most interesting to me, I think. Um, and possibly the most dangerous yeah. to a group as well. So we're really excited to see these next couple episodes. Yeah. I'm so excited. Like, I can't to wait to watch them. See what happens. We're excited to see them. And uh, just something I would kind of say to end is that, uh, you know, everyone has their own struggles. You mentioned that everyone in this show looks so happy. And, you know, it, it's true. If someone met uh, my mother in in passing i'm sure she would seem like she was the happiest person on this planet uh, but little do people know the struggles she has dealt with and the pain she is currently suffering because of you know the separation of family and other things going on that they're just heart-wrenching yeah. so you know uh, a smile is great but it's it's uh it's hard to know what's actually going on underneath uh, a happy face but Hopefully they are actually all happy and yeah. that that uh, that it's that their smiles are for a reason and they are actually happy. That would be that would be awesome. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're excited to like I said, um this next week we'll release two videos, one for each of the last episodes to get through more about Gloria Vale. And again, if you want to hear more of what it was like for Sam growing up in polygamy, then please like and subscribe and we'll talk to y'all soon. Thank you all. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>